Hi, I'm John Gosley, and this is the Transatlantic Poetry Series, July 19th, 2015. Today we have two very great uh, poets with us. Uh, first, we'll have Naomi Foyle read. Naomi is the author of several poetry pamphlets and two full-length collections. The Night Pavilion was the 2008 Poetry Society recommendation and the World Cup uh, from 2010 uh, were both published by Waterloo Press in the UK. Her readings and appearances at the Cooley Festival in Limerick and uh, she's also read at the an art house in Berlin. Uh, she originally trained in theater and just collaborated with many artists, musicians, and filmmakers on projects including the prize winning video poem Good Definition, uh, to, which came out in 2004, and uh, she has several spoken word CDs. Uh, she's a librettist of the award-winning Buffon Opera Hush, which is performed in Toronto. Uh, she also has written a short verse drama, The Strange Wife, which was produced by the Bush Theatre in 2011 as part of 66 books. 21st century writers speak to the King James Bible. Our second reader today is going to be Michael Pryor. His poems have appeared in magazines and journals across North America and the UK, including uh, our Fjords Review. Uh, he was the winner of the Magma Poetry's 2013 Edgers Prize, the Walvers' 2014 Poetry Prize, and Grain's 2014 Short Grain Contest. He's very uh, accomplished for being a young poet, and I'm very glad to host him today. Uh, his first Jap book, uh, Swan Dive, was published by Frog Hollow Press in 2016. And his first full-length collection uh, will be published by the Hikul Press in 2016. And I will remember what the name of that is in a few minutes and uh, interject that before uh, he reads after Naomi. Michael holds an MA from the University of Toronto and in fall 2015 um, we'll be welcoming him to the United States as he'll be starting an MFA in poetry at Cornell University. So uh, without any further ado, uh, here is Naomi Foyle. Sorry, there was a, a tiny adieu there, I think, while I was getting my camera on. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you very much to John for this invitation. Uh, I'm very excited by the chance to read for transatlantic poetry. Uh, being transatlantic is integral to my identity as a British Canadian, um, which you might not be able to tell from my accent because I sometimes think I'm Eastern European for some reason, but that's probably because of everywhere else that I've lived um, over the years. Uh, it also feels very timely, the transatlantic theme, and I'll, I'll develop that as, as I go through the reading. Um, I'd like to actually start with a poem by my mother, uh, the late poet uh, and sh short fiction writer Brenda Richards. So she died 21 years ago uh, last Sunday, so she's been on my mind. Uh, this is a poem that she wrote that I always felt somehow was for me, uh, and very much about the the placelessness I felt um, moving between uh, travels and places where I've lived and, and states of mind as well, that I think she was very empathic towards. You don't know where to put yourself. It's snowing outside and inside out the socks dry on the towel where the cat lies on her back wanting to be scratched. That black belly can stand so much and no more. Out come her claws and your sucking blood. Inside you is a bone picked clean long ago when promises were polished spoons, stars crossed your path, and your cat was white. A glass weight keeps your secrets and seals old flames. Settle down like feathers after the axe in a yard of chickens. The cat is asleep, dust is not disturbed. So why must you move like an ocean roller 
a bullet ricocheting from steel to steel. You walk from wall to wall to wall, a blizzard, you drift, flakes and flakes. I lived in three continents by the time I was seven. So when we settled in Liverpool after Hong Kong and London, I really wasn't keen on going to Canada. This is Mrs. Coleman. In her portable classroom, she draws a map of Canada. Forests, mountains, lakes. You are going to live there right after Halloween. She tells the whole class about her niece in Toronto, how lucky you are. Canada is such a beautiful place. For a month, the bulletin board is covered with pictures of moose and beavers and bears. Mrs. Coleman's voice has the power to tell a grizzly to sit down, and her nose is as sharp as your parents' decision. But her big, comfortable body and grey grandma hair feel like home. You love Mrs. Coleman. She is drawing a huge, strange map of goodbye to keep in your pocket forever. Canada is an avalanche that buries all the roads. Glooscap's winter. Glooscap is a Wabanaki legendary figure uh, of the eastern coast, actually, of Canada and also the States. And he's a creator figure. And though he has godlike powers, his name means man created from speech. So we thanks to the original owners of North America, Blue Scaps Winter. Outside the sky is an unwashed porridge bowl. Frost attacks the windows like a skin disease. You trudge across the bitter park to school in snowsuits, scarf, mitts, toque, and balaclava. At home, the back door stairwell is a slushy jumble of boots and gloves that drive your mother mad. You pull the drawstrings tight inside your hood. The giant bulletin board in the library is empty. The reading competition is over, and you won. Now Mrs. East wants you to decorate the space, not with snowflakes made from full scat, not with a flattened, boring Christmas tree, but a blown-up scene from Glooscap's winter, the creator beholding his first long world of cold. You spend hours in the library after school, at lunch break too, and even recess. Laura helps sometimes. You tell her what to do, ripping and tearing snow drifts of white tissue to be layered and pasted across a hot pink sky, livid as a bruise. The colors are from the book but you choose all the collage materials yourself. Tin foil icicles hang from real pine branches. Teepees cut from felt stand in a circle at the back behind a flowing river of twisted cellophane. And glue scaps, buckskin robes and moccasins are cut and stitched from sheets of sandpaper, fine and rough patches glinting in the fluorescent light of the library keeping the creator warm. So I think when you have a kind of disturbed psyche you know, as a child, it's, uh, it's, it's part of you and where, but where you can always come back to really found is creativity. Um, I had a really difficult time in high school, um, being in the hospital after suicide attempts. And, um, I kind of feel that my mum's poem was really about me running away from myself in a lot of ways. Uh, but I've survived and uh, I've got to a point now where you know, I'd like to help encourage other people who are feeling you know, that it's very hard to hang on. You know, please do because things, things can and, and really will get better if you get help. help you need. Uh, this is a poem of someone who didn't make it. It's said in Toronto, I wanted to do a Toronto poem uh, for Michael, and it's a Toronto poet poem. It's for the poet Jones, uh, who was writing in the 80s when I was in Toronto. Blonde, with watery eyes, he wore a navy blue trench coat and beret. His poem, Things I Have Stuck Up My Asshole, the one he blew up and pasted all over the streets of Toronto, was quite famous. 
The list included a cold ear of corn and the CN Tower. He also wrote a column for an occasional paper. The one I read described him flushing away a giant ship without any real sense of accomplishment at all. I met him once at the bookshop where I worked. I was sitting at the till with Henry, the jovial small press rep, discussing his spring range when we came to Jones's new book. Weak poet, Henry scoffed. Tedious, full of self-pity. I've never thought much of him. Jones had attitude, an anemic Canadian Morrissey with no desire to sing. On the other hand, his bleak appraisal of his turd had not enhanced my life in any way. I paused. Jones chose this moment to emerge wraith-like from the shelves. Thank you, Henry, he said before his exit. I know I can always rely on you to promote my work. The suicide of a poet extinguishes a candle in the darkest passage of the world. I'd also like to read a poem for another late Canadian poet, my friend Peter Cully, whose death, recent death I only, uh, I only just heard, heard of. This is a poem I wrote um, when I was living in Vancouver when I met Pete, who was very kind to me, took me under his wing and sort of understood my slough of despond uh, and uh, fed it with uh, jazz and poetry and uh, compilation tapes uh, and great affection. Blue Line Culling, 3 a.m. One. Tipped off the edge of the bush tug, she took out her penis and began. Two. Decachet, nostalgia's dew, salt sweepings over water, done to a returning, cut the sedimental slough. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Paint her shimmy self into a round corner note. Dive to get redizified. Hemispheres jazz hard with air. Three. A wash on Mercy's shoreline. No more poems. Badly grew. That was from February Few, which was a, a book I wrote when I was working at the Clinton School of Writing. Um, in a very free form way, uh, all those poems. Um, I write more formal poems now, uh, but this one came from a dream. It was published in New York. I was going to read a poem set in New York about a visit there, but then I remembered when we were chatting um, before, before the broadcast uh, that I actually had a poem recently published in uh, Washington Square Journal. Uh, so here it is. The second reserve goalkeeper on the USA women's football team goes AWOL in Shanghai. Rice paddies stacked like plastic plates up the mountain. Crows circling the Falun Gong messenger, the man's body twisted like the character for sex. When in doubt, rent a moped. Gravel stung the chassis. Strips of skin peeled off my calves. The whole country shrunk to a stadium tunnel after a 16th minute red card. You slip on your own sweat. I traced him back to an underground hotel, wet floors leading to a doll's house kitchen, always open. I'd stopped asking what the meat was. Steamed dumplings, glazed protein, eat, the ring in my pocket with the rest of the cash. I was convinced they'd find me on the steps by the canal. But though my fingers barely reached the first knuckles, the two odd gauntlets the seamstress gave me, dredged from the sludge, dubbins to a humidor gleam, brought me luck. I sent the ring to the seamstress. She turned her cheek. I kissed her hair. A crow's way esplanaded on its pinions as a black beak drills into an eye socket. A scarlet claw pairs off an ear. I think I'll come back to this side of the pond. I think I'm doing a round-the-world trip, aren't I? Um, 
but uh, back to London here with um, Rule 24. The woman is sitting upstairs at the back of the bus. She has a rucksack. She is reading the Quran. She is rocking back and forth. She is shaking. The man watches, waits. Across the city, his boss is checking the woman's text messages. The man's gun aches for his hand. He is sweating. This is his job. He has no choice. Since the world began, it has been juddering towards its unmaking. The anonymous face of an appropriate force. His doubts, if not fears, are long gone. He scarcely has time for regretting. Fatal mistakes that were nobody's fault. False alarms in his earpiece sound again and again. But redemption is there for the taking. The woman is sitting upstairs at the back of the bus. She has a rucksack. She is reading the Quran. She is rocking back and forth. She is shaking. Uh, I wrote that poem after um, a conversation with a barrister uh, who explained that there's, there are constantly these, there's just a, you know, obviously there's just a call, center call, call room, uh, where the police are just constantly monitoring people. Um, on their phone calls um, and buses uh, and we're reading the Quran it lead to uh, having the gun pulled on you in a bus so that was a road road that poem when I was getting involved in um, was getting involved in human rights activism around Israel and Palestine uh, and I would like to read a poem now to commemorate last year's uh, bombardment of Israel. It's a poem that I actually wrote in 2009, so things got worse, and so maybe the poem just seems, yeah, so it still needs to be read. It's called Anne 13 Israelis. Uh, because during that bombing over that December period, in 23 days, over 1,300 Palestinians were murdered, over 500 children and 5,300 injured. And last year, from July 8th, between July 8th and August 21st, uh, over 2,200 Palestinians were murdered. And 71 Israelis were killed and one Thai national. Donate your status. Donate your despair. Donate your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife. Donate your children. Donate a hospital. Donate 1,313 candles. Donate a match. Match a donation. Donate the fine line between you and your neighbor. Donate a bucket of soil, a packet of seeds. Donate a truckload of donuts. Donate a moment of doubt. Donate your most sophisticated haircut. Donate a crate of sophistry detectors. Donate your will to survive. Do not do nothing. Donate your body temperature, your kidney, your library. Donate your deepest desire. Do not fear scorn, rage, isolation. Donate a round table. Donate the freedom you've forgotten you have. Donate your shopping list, your love of avocados, shorong fruit and dates. Donate the sweater your grandmother gave you. Donate a winter of warm sleepless nights. Donate a new notion of nation. Donate a persistent belief that despite all evidence to the contrary, everyone everywhere is extraordinary. Donate an hour of your day to stand up and demonstrate peace is a process of learning to listen and giving is not giving in. I know that the situation can seem intractable in the Middle East, but I do believe being part of the boycott 
divestment and sanctions movement, that it's something that international pressure uh, can really help uh, to eventually you know, resolve um, and move towards uh, justice, justice for the people of Palestine, um, and peace for everyone in the region. Um, Uh, as I said, I, I'll conclude um, really with a short poem set in Brighton, but as I said, it's a very timely reading for me um, because I'm hoping to, well, I will be, I will be coming back uh, to uh, Canada uh, and hopefully New York uh, next April for uh, the Ad Astra Festival, Science Fiction Festival, uh, where I'll be launching my, um, uh, the, the New York, the, sorry, the North American release of my first uh, science fiction the first science fiction novel in my series, The Gaia Chronicles, Astra. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a very nice thing. And I know my mother will be proud. My mother was always very supportive of my writing. And I will like to end um, on Brighton Beach with the Pablo Neruda barbecue. Uh, uh, on the 10th anniversary of my mother's death, I realized that it would have been Pablo Neruda's 100th birthday. Um, so I ended up um, celebrating her life and the spirit of poetry and Pablo Neruda and also my friend Marcin Crawford from Belfast um, who'd also passed away with a, a, a barbecue, an annual barbecue um, on, on the beach. The Pablo Neruda barbecue. Poets, singers, newlyweds, share olives, wine, guitars, books and bits of Spanish. Poke sausages with skewers, orchestrate umbrellas, Softly rumbling clouds, charcoal seared with gold, fill their bellies with our smoke. And when the sky splits open, a tender ray of sunshine warms our faces as we read poems of love and tomatoes, elemental odes, the white lips of the sea sucking at the stones. Thank you. Thank you to John and Robert Peake as well. Uh, for, for inviting me and having me on and really to my comments. Thank you for reading, Naomi, those um, some somber poems there at the end, and I think uh, important ones overall. Next, we will have Michael Pryor read his uh, book that will be coming out in 2016. It's called Model Disciple. It will be coming out from Vehicule Press. First became acquainted with uh, Michael's work uh, when he submitted to Fjord's Review just a couple of years ago and I could see right away that this uh, is very sophisticated work and that it was light at the same time. It has that kind of like nuance and style to it that really makes you feel uh, like something great is happening. And so without uh, any further introduction, here is Michael. Hi, John, and hello, Naomi. Thank you so much for having me, uh, John and, and Robert. And Naomi, thank you for such a, a lovely reading. Um, I'm going to start, uh, well, I should talk a bit about the book first. The book that's coming out in 2016 is, as John said, called Model Disciple. Um, and it has a lot to do with kind of uh, cultural inheritance and intergenerational uh, memory, especially a lot to do with kind of my own identity. I have um, Japanese-Canadian uh, family on my mother's side and then fa uh, people of English descent on my father's side. So uh, the book is a lot about me trying to find a way to situate myself between both sides of the family in a way that seems true and authentic to my own experience. Um, so uh, the first poem I'm going to start with is called A Priori, and the first line of the poem is where we took the title of the book from. So, A Priori. I learned my Latin like a model disciple. It was the year of our Lord. Our Lord had left. On the estuary... Herons scythed shiners and bullfrogs. They pulsed against the inevitable like the muscles of a song. In the first month, I was named godfather to a dog. I remained wayward, the prodromal son. My own terrier died of tumors. Eyelids like moths in a chloroform jar. Recall, 
A clock wrapped in a towel may substitute for a sleeping mother's heart. Later, all motion would stop, although at points I believed we were hurtling through the air at incredible heights. We became what we beheld. Know then that my father took to morning, morning like, a dog, like a dog to a flock of galls, a flock of galls to the sky. Know also my father's father was a gall, no, a raven. His sadness wore black wings. He trained it until inheritable, built its nest inside a mess of genes. Dormant, then not, like an egg, or the unexpected blue of eyes that skipped a generation. Their enduring question of whether she had been true. In the final month, I delivered a prayer in place of a eulogy, the words vulgar on my tongue. I had hoped to understand. You do understand. Um, this is a title poem from my chapbook, Swan Dive. Um, and it's after Natalie Shapiro, a great American poet. Um, and it has an epigraph uh, from Hamlet, and it's Ophelia speaking. I was the more deceived. It's hard to stay angry on a bed of water, harder yet to remain above the tide, hence the anchor, hence the dive. For those of us who practice our Ophelia, we creatures of conscience, let it be known that I have keened the lake in colder seasons, seen the loves return by acts of ice. Olive bottles, agate necklaces bought in beachfront shops for cheap, I shall the effect of this good lesson keep. I rearrange my lost and found. That man who was discovered rooting the bottom three decades after his death. In his boat, a fish still rides the line. Hear me out. Even the swan's necks don't shape a heart when they hunt beneath the dark. Part of uh, my approach in the book to, um, to, to, to trying to situate myself somewhere and to try and uh, interrogate my own identity is uh, to don a series of masks and to try a series of ventriloquisms. And so this poem is called Ventriloquism for Dummies. And it, uh, it cribs a couple lines and its meter from Robert Browning's Child Roll into the Dark Tower Came. So Ventriloquism for Dummies. Pine plosives, alveolar carpentry, my life lived like an elaborate glove. Tilt my head, a pale seashell scribed by lave, and listen to the few unfurling thoughts, the dry shake of dust. Semperitum, no? I love that girl with a Cheshire cat grin, inked across the nape of her next vellum. My hinged digits once traced its glow as if it were a sliver of moon. Nowadays, she works nights on an alabaster lake. My first thought was, he lied in every word, and I wasn't wrong. Charlie McCarthy may be my homeboy, but that suede coffin became my home. Long dawns in the valley, I dreamed a redwood forest. And at its center was another jester with a cheap suit and misplaced mandible. Drop me, toss me, and I lie limp. A tidal tryst of bleached branches, a good joke gone bad, or a line soured by time. Got wood? It's all I've got. Try not to notice these synchronized lips, that hoary cripple with malicious eye. Um. Whenever I read this next poem, people always ask me if this actually happened. And I have to say, it did. Um, so necessary omens. You're accessible, she says, meaning I bore her. If difficulty is a virtue, then we might be saints. Who was it that once equated virtue with moderation? Kanye West, I think. Most quotations may be attributed to the internet, plagiarism being just an ugly way of remembering a pretty thing. Once in a city grown from the rich mud of a river's delta. I watch chrysalises suspended among magnolia branches, more spectral than prescient of birth. I'd walk that way every day and not noticed until a friend diverted my sight. I felt terrible knowing it was my duty to look up occasionally, to keep one eye trained on what couldn't be controlled. Like the time my sister let her guinea pig out of its cage and a hawk dropped down from the clouds and took it. The future had arrived. Um, I was glad to hear Naomi read some Canadian or Canada-related poems. Um, I think all Canadians uh, have, a, have a few winter poems, which doesn't do much to dispel kind of the stereotypes about the country, but 
even though it's the middle of summer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a winter poem. And this one's called Hibernal Country. With alarming frequency, the winters arrived or were uncovered. I could never tell. Pets died from negligence in the suburbs. And in the city, we watched the stupidest pigeons bud the building tops. Then the unlit nights as ice shellacked the lines and brought them sparking to the ground. The dark, like a gorgeous secret, lay undecipherable and heavy on our shoulders trudging home. The candles flickering in the window, our father battling the drifts with a plastic shovel. When had he grown old? I would cover one tea light in a jar and watch the flame choke and stutter on its own appetite constrained. I wanted to end it, but couldn't. Afraid of my actions as prediction, its heat somehow satellite to our own. The radio fluttered in the kitchen, the wax pooled low. There was nothing to do but wait. We played games of hide and seek, where no one was hidden or found, least of all our parents, who held hands and watched, sightless from their chairs. With the lamp switched off, it's all too close to bear. The candles died, the snow forgot our steps. The house that once bled light lies empty now. Our patients seemed a series of darkening halls, and at the center the circuit breakers, cold and useless as if blown. This poem's also from the chat book, and it's called Familiarity Principle, which um, in psychology is the principle that people tend to be attracted more to people they see more often, which to me sounds like the chicken and egg thing, but um, here it is, Familiarity Principle. Your letter lies unopened on the counter. On screen, Lauren Bacall slides off Bogart's lap and leans against the frame. You know how to whistle, don't you? Consider the question. Seventy years ago, it tented trousers in the theater's dusk. Those dreamers returned home to hold their wives and imagine the life apart. My first tried to teach me how to whistle. She curled her tongue, summoned every taxi in film noir. I pursed my lips, blue, and sprayed spit all over the sheets. Whom had I failed to reach? The call seven decades removed, my predecessors seeding the earth. Come on. We all took Psych 101. Does no one remember the story about the husband who went to work overseas? He wrote his wife a letter every day. She left him for the mailman. So as I mentioned before, the book has a lot to do about sort of the cultural inheritance I have. And um, one of the things that's always interested me is because of my last name, uh, people don't often, who haven't met me, don't identify me as a writer of color. Um, so recently I had a bunch of poems included in uh, an anthology for Asian Canadian writers. And one of the editors actually uh, emailed me and asked, uh, "Are you, you're sure you're of Asian Canadian descent, right? And I was like, yes, yes. So I, I get that a lot. Um, so this poem's kind of a, a coming to terms with that. Uh, and I should also mention that my, uh, my mother's uh, maiden name is Mori, which in Japanese translates to forest. So this is called Onomastic. My name. Some no-nonsense Protestant breaking folds of soil in February, torching the trees to wring free the greater crop before his neighbors. His accent, Atlantic, Transplanted, a mealy-mouthed English slurred by birch switch-wielding priests in prior years. Stigmata forever burning lessons in his palm. The glories of his late century remain closed to me like the onion skit of a psalm book or the good book lost to my father, who pulled us from Sunday school to watch Lord of the Rings, cheering when Boromir slouches to his knees and takes three arrows through the breast. Our name means loyalty, means never stop. I checked. It means one devoted to God. What about those other syllables, mirrored by marriage, the tones I can't form from my tongue's split root? The kanji in front of me doesn't lie, clear as the day charcoal first coalesced on paper. Forest, she says. I've just got two poems left. Um, this one's another mask poem, and it's called Cuttlefish. I meant to acknowledge what you hadn't yet confessed. Just as a dog will tolerate strangers who approach him sideways and with an extended hand, 
we've let inconveniences beget emergencies. Phones closed, switched to airplane mode. The atmosphere returned us to our proper sphere. How could I have known I was still broadcasting on descent? The slow burn of aluminum scattering that which lacks mass at lower temperatures, pressures undiscerned. I cycled through my states, wore an ill-fitting mask. Regret thick and dramatic in the chamber of the heart, its porthole was a small aquarium. If I tapped on the glass, bright denizens below swam in and out of the dark, like fallen constellations treading water, about to flicker out. The impossibility of disembarking stirred an eel in my throat. Our departure forgotten, ambient lighting asked for patience, pleaded for continued understanding, as the unclaimed future rattled in the machine. I saw what was needed, what I had felt, the dim glow of resignation through the tint of night, as if clarity was time's unheeded toll. The portal's agile shrouds pulsed with the blue of wave and wind. Who rewrote our dialogue? The same words were called in different colored ink. Confused, I thought of the cuttlefish, struggling to reflect the inane geometrics of a scientist's whim. A life spent matching exteriors, while the interior remained unchanged. Um, so the last poem I'm gonna, gonna read is kind of an elegy, but it's an elegy for memories. Um, and it's called, The War Came As If a Dream. Our children volunteered our eyes, for they had seen more through them than us. Ironclad, sulfur born, we lived a field of camphor that embalmed our every step. It's true, we shot a man and stole his home to sleep. Later, like wind-up birds, we sang our way to ruin, past cities gutted and aflame. Lanterns shattered glassy nights on rooftop. The paper's good for naught but kindling. Our dreams grew greater than we could explain, while our prayers chose clarity over color, color over light. I fear we will remember everything a single shade. Eternity opened up but once. Our answer was a gun. So thank you so much, Robert and John, for having me. And Naomi, I hope we get to meet um, when you're in Toronto next year. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading, Michael, and elucid elucidating some of those things about identity that I think, as um, as a North American and, and European culture, that we're all still continuing to to navigate through, both in um, you know race and in gender identity as well. Um, okay, so let's we're gonna open this up to um, a few questions that people have asked, and I think what we'll do is um, I'm gonna start with asking Michael. Excuse me. What um, what is your process? Tell us some about how you um, go through that. To create a poem. Often for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, or maybe Naomi can speak to this too. But I, uh, it's often uh, a, a word, a, a phrase, or an image, or something very short is the first thing that comes. Um, I always carry a notebook with me, as as most writers do, I think. Um, yeah, uh, for me, I, it's not very often that the poem comes whole form. It's usually I have an idea and I have to reverse engineer that back onto the page. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of my own like process of writing, I'm not <laughs> I'm not particularly disciplined or as disciplined as I should be, um, but I do find myself incredibly productive in in short periods of time. Um, yeah. And uh, Naomi, Robert in the UK asks, you know. Do you have any cyclical patterns to your creativity? Do you have like a minimum or a maximum amount of things that you write a day? Well, at the moment, because I'm writing the novels, I have to write I wrote two thousand words a day. You know, it's uh, it's 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 a very strange thing. But once you once you kind of get into the it's a rhythm. Once I'm into the rhythm, I can do it. Um, 
And I, what I had to get over at the beginning was this kind of fear that, you know, I've, I've been moving from poetry where I would spend months, you know, months on a sonnet um, to, to sit down and write a novel in a year. Um, you know, the fear was always, well, how can I edit it? How can I shape it? And now I just kind of accept that a novel is a very different thing. It has a very different, uh, a very different rhythm and flow to it. Um, and I enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy the, the freedom of finding out where it's going to take me, uh, novel writing. Um, so there is, a, there is a kind of a discipline, but within the discipline, I don't structure it, overly structure it. Um, I don't have a really tight, I don't have really tight outlines. I like to see what the characters are going to do and say. Um, and in terms of poems, I feel that they're now, I mean, I've got a bit more luxurious position as opposed to writing my PhD when I had to, I had to write poems also for a deadline. Now they, they well up inside me, so I can think that they, it is, it can be a phrase, but it can also be a physical feeling. It has a kind of a feeling of pressure between my ribs, really. Um, and then that gets me, yeah, gets me engrossed. First by hand and then, and then on the laptop. Hope that answers the question. Michael, can you tell us uh, about a the few of the poets that you're reading right now and maybe recommend to our uh, viewers now and in the future who you think they should be looking at that's on the Canadian poetry scene? Hi, yeah, so um, I don't know, they're, they're, uh, one of my favorite poets, and I think she's really kind of become an international star. Um, she's had poems in the Paris Review now. Her, her latest book come out with SSG, um, and she had a, a new and selected come out in the UK with Blood Axe, is uh, Karen Soli, um, her on the cover. She's, she's great. Uh, her newest book called, is called uh, The Road In Is Not The Road Out, and there's not the same road out, and uh, before that it was Pigeon, I think was her third collection. Uh, she's really phenomenal, and she's been a major influence on a lot of uh, Canadian poets of my generation, I think. Um, I'm also a huge fan of Amanda Jernigan. Um, this is her latest book called All the Daylight Hours. And uh, I think she's a, she's a really, uh, she is such, her poems are such uh, like little Yeetsy and gems. They're, they're intricate, they're, they're highly formalist. Um, just for example, I'll read a really short poem from near the end of of the book called Tome with the Gift of a Timepiece. Time keeps its watch upon your pulse. Your pulse may keep a watch on time. So let this be upon your wrist. Hold up against its perfect rhyme, that which is slant and off and else. So uh, she's one of my favorite poets. Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, a couple of other people. Um, whoops. Um, Sarah Peters put out a really good book recently called 1996. She was um, she did her MFA at Boston, but she she lives here in Ontario now. She was a Stegner Fellow. It's a really great book of kind of um, doing interesting things with a confessional voice, uh, subverting it in certain ways, uh, reappropriating uh, kind of more of the moves of like Lowell and Berryman and, and Plath for for uh, for uh, um, for poems that are more interested in investigations of gender identity and perhaps feminism. And, uh, of course, uh, Ken Babstock, um, he's a great Canadian poet. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, Methodist Hatchet. I really also like a book like him called uh, Airstream Land Yacht. So that's who I'm reading right now. It's been important to me lately. And Naomi, I think that that's a good question uh, for uh, you as well. Can you recommend some uh, UK uh, poets to us, please? Well, I'm going to rec recommend an entire press, which is my press, Waterloo Press, um, because I just think we have like such a fantastic range of poets. Um, Simon Jenner, the editor, has sort of made it his mandate to cover the spectrum between the Cambridge modernists and the Brighton naifs, as he put it, um, but also a lot of international poets in translation. So um, we have... I mean, it's where to start, really, but I, I, we were talking earlier about science fiction and poetry and how it seems as though a lot of poets in the UK in particular are quite interested in the past, in memory, um, uh, which seems to be kind of quite a strong vein of, li of lyric poetry. 
but very few in, in visualizing the future or envisioning the future. But Jeremy Reed um, is a uh, uh, an exception to that um, with his glam glam poetry, he calls it, um, and he's also a great London poet. So there's you see that Jeremy Reed. Um, that's his West End survival kit, and he's incredibly prolific, and um, and also writes about poetry and speaks about poetry. Um, so I would I would really recommend him. Um, my friend Bernadette Kremen, she's my friend because uh, I admire her so much and love her so much. Um, uh, she's she's someone who kind of speaks poetry. I never really feel like I really speak poetry, but she does. Um, here's her book, Speechless. Um, she's kind of there's a kind of a yeah, bed sit land. There's um, poems, but they're, they're, her, her her metaphors are just so striking. His um, kind of at random, really. His pulse drugs, his pulse drags its club foot across the screen. A broken bird flying east in a green sky. She also writes a lot about hospitals. Um, yeah, and she's she's getting a collection of new and selected out um, with Salmon Press in Ireland uh, soon as well. So that would, that would be one to look out for. Um, Simon Jenner himself, uh, who uh, poems are just uh, you can pour over them. You can pour over a single poem for an afternoon. I think they're so rich um, and surprising and uh, um, yeah, I mean, curious, you know, there are just fireworks going off everywhere in Simon Jenner's poems. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I could go on, but there they are. I've got a rainbow. If I could, I could, if I could move my laptop, I could show you. They're all become beautiful books as well with uh, French flaps, they're called. Um, so if you buy one, you know, it's something that you really save on the treasure as well in, in, in your hand. Um, the e-books are now available. Thank you. Very cool. Um, I think that we see a lot of uh, politicalization of poetry. Um, I think especially like I, I feel like in the last year. And I think that a lot of poetry can be political, but it's important to not get too focused on those kinds of things as well. What are some issues or things that um, you both feel like should be addressed in contemporary poetry, perhaps that are often overlooked? And I ask that with, you know, thought in mind that contemporary poetry seems to be addressing a pretty wide spectrum of things. And um, so I'd be curious as to how uh, you all would answer that question. Now we want you to go ahead and go first. Well, it's a very good question. I think there are big differences between the states and uh, the UK in terms of the diversity of poets uh, publishing, which is a really crucial political you know, aspect of poetry, just who is, who is getting heard, um, who is getting published, who is getting reviewed. Uh, there's been a lot of activism here around um, getting uh, black and Asian poets um, published. The way that uh, the project worked uh, was a mentorship project uh, called Ten um, Blood Acts. Again, in, uh, ultimately published. They published two two collections coming out of the mentorship project now. But that came out of some really dire statistics. You know, like only one percent of poetry books or, the, or new poetry books are being published by by Black and Asian poets and, and poets of other ethnic minorities here in the UK. So, I think. I think that when we open up the field to the poets, then 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 we're going to open up the topics as well. Um, for myself, I found I've tried to write about activism because I think that there can be a kind of a quietism in how poetry is framed, of how lyric poetry is framed. That somehow the classic Gordon poetry makes nothing happen. Um, Seamus Heaney, whatever you say, say nothing. 
so I have tried to say I have tried to say uh, what I'm doing, what I'm working towards, um, the experience that I've had, the the passion that I feel, without, but as as in an open field really, because when I'm when I'm as an activist, I'm I'm meeting people, I'm having emotionally rich, complex, contradictory experiences. They're not dogmatic experiences that I have um, as an activist. So. Um, you know, in fact, they're incredibly dynamic experiences. So, I guess for me, that's where I try to take my politics and, and my poetry, um, particular. Yeah. Thank you. Please go ahead, Michael. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I would agree with Naomi that part of the, the biggest part is to have more uh, published writers of color or uh, queer writers. Uh, and th that's a big part of the discussion that's happening in Canada right now. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's recently uh, uh, someone released a study showing uh, who was winning the prizes uh, based on uh, ethnicity or whether they were a person of color or not. And it came out that uh, it was a very minuscule percentage of prizes uh, were being won by writers of color in Canada. Um, and that creates a whole conversation around how do we em empower more writers of color to, to be writing and submitting, especially to a system that, that seems so set against them. Um, there are groups in Canada doing great work like Quila, which uh, every year publishes an annual count of uh, the amount of uh, book reviews uh, uh, of uh, women writers and the, and, uh, the amount of women reviewers uh, being published. Um, for me personally, uh, it's a. Uh, I have. I've had an interesting experience because I, I. I'm not sure how much I identify with the term writer of color or how. How I'm. Th I'm not quite uh, certain yet how I'm thinking about it, uh, when it, with application to myself personally. Um, in my own work, I'm really interested in the politics of poetic form, which is what sort of ideological baggage do we we bring along with when we write a sonnet or when we write. Uh, in blank verse and things like that, um, which is a lot of what my book's about. The last poem in the book um, is about going with my Japanese Canadian grandfather to visit all the uh, camps from the Second World War where Japanese Canadians were put into internment um, in the province I'm from, which is British Columbia. So we went on this three-week trip to where he was held uh, as a boy, where his family was held, where friends were held. There's, a, there's about over half a dozen camps in the interior. And I, I wrote a blank verse poem about it because I was interested in exploring how blank verse, which is a you know one of the most canonical uh, inherited forms of poetry, could be put to a kind of almost um, uh, subversive use to speak about race and to speak about identity uh, in, in kind of postmodern Canada, um, or whether it, it can be used that way. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a really complex issue. There's been lots of great discussions in Canada. There's a good uh, journal in Canada called The Puritan that has uh, a great blog called The Town Crier that often engages with these kinds of issues and stuff like that. There's also the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, which is a great organization based in Vancouver uh, that helps publish and uh, uh, foster young Asian Canadian writers. But yeah, that's kind of my understanding of the situation in Canada, at least. I can't speak much to the UK or America. Well, thank you both for um, joining us this, this afternoon and, and evening in your case, Naomi. I think that these are both um, some very good answers to these questions. And I, I look forward to you know all of our world continuing to get really integrated on an emotional and philosophical and psychological level because we already are on a physical level so that these other things aren't fully um, so that everything's not fully seen as one cohesive thing is I think strange in a way um, so thank you so much for both of you being on and reading these wonderful poems it was extremely enjoyable and um, Thank you, everybody, for uh, watching. And in two weeks, on August 1st, two Sundays from now, uh, Jonathan Burke and Jericho Brown will be
reading, and I believe Robert Peake is going to be hosting that show. So we look forward to seeing you then, and uh, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your weekend.